First of all, we have to show contact with our neighbors, immediate neighbors. Immediate uh, old civilization with India is Sumeria. Sumeria is where Babylon and other things are. A lot of people say we learn things from Babylon, right? So we want to show what contact we had with Babylon. So we can show from 3000 BC to 500 BCE, we have had contact with Babylon. The first thing we have to show is, is there evidence in India, internal evidence of trade or any kind of uh, uh, going out of India uh, and so on. In the Rig Veda, these verses 1.25.7, it says, he who knows the path of birds flying through the air, abiding in the ocean, knows the course of ships. So Rig Veda is saying that somebody who knows the path of the birds, why birds? Because in those days, they didn't have radio and other such things, right? To know where the land is, they'll carry birds with them, like a crow or something, and they release the crow. The crow will fly towards land, and they know land is over there. So that has been said over here, abiding, he knows the course of ships. So it's talking about ships over here. Then in another place, it says, merchants, covetous of gain, crowd the ocean on vessels on a voyage. So Rig Veda is still talking not only about sea-based voyage, he's talking about the merchants like Vaishyas, who are going on ships to get some profits, talking about that. Then it's talking about a hundred old ship. These are not small ships, but with hundred oars. So whenever Rig Veda was written, I'm not going to tell you it's written here, there, and so on. Whenever Rig Veda was written, there's already evidence that Indians were going out of India, trading with various other people. That is the evidence from here. We have evidence during Harappa times that we had trade with a whole lot of other people to Babylon and beyond. From Lothal, they would hug the coast and go all the way to these places, Dilmon, for example, near Bahrain, and go all the way in the Persian Gulf till here. This is where we have Babylon, the Elamites, the Kassites, and so on, including the land route, right? Mohenjo-daro, Kot DJ, Shortugai, and others. They had a, a land-based uh, uh, trade also. How do we know that? Because all over Central Asia, as well as in Sumeria, we got Indus seals. We got artifacts from the Indus. That's why we know contact has been there. We can see the impact by the philosophy that we have. In India, we have something called Vaisheshika philosophy, right? It is just perception and inference. Exactly the same philosophy is there in Mesopotamia. Even they had a philosophy that was based on perception and inference, pratyaksha and anumana. So just like that, internal perception, external perception, and anumana to build new knowledge. That is what uh, uh, Rishi Kanada's Vaisheshika is. We see a very similar kind of epistemology even in Mesopotamia. Then we have evidence in common text. For example, uh, Gopal Stavig, he shows nine commonalities, Chatapata Brahmana, Mahabharata, and the Babylonian Gilgamesh creation accounts, the deities. And, and in the Babylonian accounts itself, it talks about who they are. The Babylonian people say, we migrated from the east by sea, from the Persian Gulf. Immigrants brought a developed civilization with knowledge of agriculture, metalworks, and the art of writing. This is what the Babylon accounts say. They say we came from the east. We came by sea from the Persian Gulf. And these immigrants taught us agriculture. They taught us writing. This is clearly uh, some of our ancestors have gone to these kind of places. This is a scientific paper that came out in 2022 in Nature. And they wanted to tell how did millets come? Millet is, for example, ragi and other things are millets, right? They wanted to see how did these millets come to the fertile crescent. And they say the oldest millets were in India, and these red dots are 1000 BCE. It has come to this area by 1000 BCE. And they say this is by the maritime route from India, it has come to the Persian Gulf and spread to all of these areas. So even archaeobotany, by examining old seeds, we can tell the story. And clearly, it is showing transmission from India. Just like their own account is saying, it's the Indians who taught us agriculture. This is the evidence that came in 2022, last year, by scientists studying about how did uh, millets come over here. Then we have got something called Dasaragnya, the Battle of the Ten Kings, the Rig Veda, that says that there were ten tribes, and the other side was Sudas, the king. And the ten tribes are defeated, and they were forced to live in, leave India, the Anus and Drihus and so on. And there are several people who are trying to say, who are these people, the Dahi, for example, Afghanistan, or the Dacian in Romania, and the Brigu, where the, uh, this people in the in this, uh, in Armenian area, and these people, the Baluchi, the Parthava, Parshua, Pakta, the Kiva, the Alan in Russia, and so on. So there are several attempts by scholars today to see the tribes of the Rig Veda 
and see how they are related to the people of today. And that's how they say language is also spread. If you see why Latin, Sanskrit and Greek are related, the reason is some of these very early migrations out of India that accounts for the Indo-European uh, tribes. This is a book my friend Jijat Ravi wrote on rivers of Rig Veda. He attempted to see that same Dasaragnya, what kind of people would have come out of that, the Slavic, the Baltic, Germanic, Celtic, Italic, all of them originated in this Dasaragnya battle and getting out of India, according to him. Very interesting ideas. He's used ideas from Srikanth Telegiri and linguistics also to come up with this kind of notion. Then we have evidence that India suffered 200 years of monsoon failure in 2000 BCE. I wanted to think about it for a minute. If India has a monsoon failure for one year, our GDP is going to fall down, right? Because most of our economy is agricultural. If the monsoon fails for three years, tremendous problems in the country. Farmers will be committing suicide and all kinds of issues will be there. Now I want you to think 200 years of monsoon failure. Southern Indian rivers are fed by monsoons. If there's no monsoon, Southern India would have been a dust bowl. Northern India is glacier fed. Glaciers would have melted. Even the north, there'd be water scarcity. So clearly, we, we know from uh, several publications that India suffered this monsoon failure. And there's research articles that talk about it too. For example, this is a paper that talks about oxygen-18 isotopes to try to figure out the monsoon intensity. So they say that in 2000 BCE, India had a dry spell, the highest dry spell ever seen. These are all the wet periods, these are all the dry periods. So exactly 4,000 years ago or 2000 BCE, we had a very, very dry spell. Even science can correlate this. And very surprisingly, this is a high quality data that came out in 2019 in a science paper. These people said, this is a very, very familiar humped bull. Any Indian village you go, you'll see this bull, right? It has got a hump that is very peculiar to India. This animal is adapted to Indian conditions, to arid conditions. The issue is that suddenly, 2000 BCE, the presence of this animal went up tremendously in West Asia, basically where northern Iraq, southern Turkey is, where Egypt is and all these places. So they said, how did this happen for in this fertile crescent? They said, this 4,200 years ago, this multi-century drought in Indus Valley led to the Bos Syndicus, this is called Zebu or Bos Syndicus, that led to these people coming over here. Indian bulls were highly prized over there because they were drought resistant. Indian bulls would not go there by themselves, right? In those days, the wealth of the people was cattle. Cattle was a wealth. So Indians with their cattle have gone wherever water is. There is no visa, passport in those days. So you had to find water. If there's no water in Mohenjo-daro, Harappa, you're just going to go. You can't take the city on your back in a knapsack. You leave everything behind. However beautiful your city is, you leave it behind. You go where water is. In this case, they have gone over here. This is an Akkadian seal in the Paris Museum, 2200 BCE. It shows the Indian bull over here, the longhorn bull. For a long time, I wondered, why is that over there, an Akkadian seal? But after this paper came out, it was clear to me, this is what the reason why they valued this animal in, in their civilization. Then we have evidence of the Mitannis and the Hittites. Who are these people? So this is the Persian Gulf. This is Babylonia. Babylonia is where today is Baghdad and Iraq is and all those places. And uh, these people, Mitannis, were where the Kurdish people are today, northern Iraq, southern Turkey. And the Hatti people are where today's Turkey is. Now, the strange thing is these people spoke Sanskrit. And we have evidence of that through several things. This paper, for example, it says there's a Mitanni ruler called Tushrata. Yes, Tushrata is very similar to Dasharata, right? So it has got a Sanskrit name. Ratha means a chariot. Right? So there itself we got some uh, Sanskrit names coming there. This ruler sent a letter to the Egyptian pharaoh called Imen Hotep in 1350 BCE. And this is a cuneiform text in the Paris Museum, even today. In this, he's saying, in the name of Aruna, uh, Varuna, in the name of Agni, in the name of the Ashwini twins, in the name of Indra, I promise not to attack you. So the peace treaties that he had are invoking the uh, Aryan, so-called Aryan deities. They are there in it. So we know that these people are Sanskrit speaking people, but how did they get there? They got there because of this time when I told you that 200 year monsoon failure in 2000 BCE, many Kshatriya people are moved out of India and settled all these places. These are warlike people who fought with the people of the Old Testament, for example. Wherever you see Old Testament people fighting some people, they were basically the Kshatriyas they were fighting and they established kingdoms in all of these places. 
we have evidence in Egyptian medicine. If you look at Egyptian medicine, you will not find any work of medicine until 1800 BCE, 1500 BC. Cajon papyrus, Ebert's papyrus, Smith papyrus. And the kind of medicine they talk about, magic, gynecology, surgery, and other things are exactly similar to Atharva Veda. Atharva Veda also has got medical treatments through drugs as well as mantras. If you don't know how to cure, you have a mantra also over there. Similar kind of things are here. Also, you see it has come after this migration of 2000 BCE. When I said that there's a monsoon failure in India 2000 BCE, our ancestors have gone all the way up to Egypt and taken their knowledge systems with them. That's what we see over here. And this is a, a work by J.F. Royal in 1837, a Britisher. And he's saying in page 116 to 150, in Egypt, they were using plants and materials from India for their drugs. All their drugs used materials made in India. That's a desert country, right? How do you get those things? So Indian things were used. He's hinting at knowledge transfer. I put this because it's very intriguing. This came out on Twitter about a month back or something where this archaeo histories person, he called this an acrobat. He said this is an Egyptian acrobat. 3,250 years old. And I said, this is not an acrobat. This is a well-known yoga position in India. So even yoga, in a sense, has been uh, taken to uh, Egypt in this particular time frame. Many more records then in, in Babylon. I'm not going to bore you. But look at this number. This Berosus is somebody who wrote the history of Babylonians. He says, 432 years. Why is that number 432 important? Because in India, we have something called Chatur Yuga. Chatur Yuga is 4 is to 3 is to 2 is to 1, that ratio. That 1 corresponds to Kali Yuga of 432,000 years. You understand? So Indian time constants are somehow present in Babylon. That is what we are seeing over here. So clearly, there are also things from Shatapatha Brahmana. There are things that have come over here, this 10,800 years and so on. Then we have got genetic studies that show that there are, far, there are settlers in Mesopotamia who seem to be related to the Indian merchants who perhaps have been trading on the Indo-Roman trade route, settled over there, and, uh, and so on. This is very interesting. So in the island of Crete, there's something called the Gnosis Palace, which they uh, recovered, and they restored the frecos on the wall. When they record, re restored it, they found the langurs, these blue monkeys over there. The issue is, these are all endemic to India. These are Indian animals. They don't belong to Greece. What were they doing in Greece? That too, in the time frame of 1600 BCE, not even the philosopher time frame of 300 BCE, but 1600 BCE, there are Indians over here. This says that not only was there trade, perhaps there was also culture and intellectual exchanges in the Minoan period itself of the Greek. Uh, uh. Then there are many, many stories. I'm not going to tell you stories here. But then any Purana story you uh, tell me, I will show you a corresponding Greek story. Slight differences will be there, but there are uh, elements. And I believe that many of these stories went around 1700 BCE. That's why we have commonality between Minoan culture and Indian culture.